So I think everybody who's going to get lunch has gotten lunch. So I think we'll start. This is one of three seminars that uh, Don Romay will present. And even though it's spelled D-A-N, it's pronounced D-O-N, just in case you need to know that for whatever reason. So Don is a visiting scholar until May 12th. He did a sabbatical here in 90 to 92, or 91, 92. 91, 92. Uh, anybody that's interested, I can give you the references that were resulted from that sabbatical. There were seminal, non-seminal papers on identifying clones on the X chromosome in your fragile X locus and other locus uh, loci on the X. But anyway, Don's been instrumental in the Human Genome Project, and his first talk will be on uh, omics, and then the next one will be on epigenomics epigenetics, and the last one will be on personalized medicine. It should all be at uh, 11 o'clock, but not in this room. I think we're going to fit it in the uh, educational building, but that was under being upgraded today. That's why it's in this room, so take it away. Okay, thank you, Charles. Yes, I have uh, almost a 50-year basis in uh, this area of genomics. And, uh, uh, that was uh, started in '69, the laboratory of Professor Albert Duval, which you know well about. I have to stand here maybe to get home. No, I think there, there may be a mobile, if it works. Probably oh, doesn't matter. Can I? about him, of course. Uh, actually, he was the one who uh, found out that uh, he could precisely determine the human chromosomes. And I know that uh, you had a picture of both him and their chromosomes before in that hall. Uh, after that, uh, I've been there. I was uh, one of the first for doing uh, molecular uh, genetics work with the uh, recombinant technologies at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, ENBL, which was one or two at the time, where, which was allowed to do it. The other one was in Bethesda, in IIH in Bethesda. So I did that in the uh, early 80s to 84, I think. And during that period, by the way, at the uh, conference in Barcelona, I met Charles Swans for the first time. And he listed me also up at the MBL. And that is situated in uh, Heidelberg in Germany, which is sort of the center of Europe, from north to south, east to west, and so forth. And uh, then I was back at the University of London. I was a member of the Human Genome Organization when it started. And I was then here for um, at this center in 91, 92. And I must say that this has been an impressive uh, organization now you're coming back and look at it from that time. Anyway, uh, I should talk about the uh, uh, Human Genome Project today being the basis of the omics. And uh, of course, the genomics is the first and the basic one, right? It, uh, where did I have oh, that one? It started in 1990, and uh, the question is why? And that was uh, the discovery, or rediscovery, we should say, of the Mendel's laws in the early 20th century, actually in the first year, in 1900. Uh, that sparked a scientific quest for understanding now, finally, the nature and conduct of genetic information. And that has propelled the biology development all over the uh, 20th century. So considering the amount of knowledge, new knowledge in genetics and the methodology that was developed, this time, 1990, was uh, pretty much ripe for starting this uh, uh, organized internationally. Because that's what it takes, considering uh, the uh, enormous thing. If uh, one can get some idea about the histories which led up to, to uh, this uh, project. One could say that the uh, 20th century uh, developments that can be divided into the quarters of the century. For the first part, it was the establishing the cellular basis of the It was the chromosomes. It's what the chromosome theory of inheritance. 
the second, uh, it was the molecular basis of heredity and uh, ending up with knowing what it was DNA and the DNA gimmicks. And then the third, from the 50s on, it was uh, unlocking the uh, informational basis of heredity. The discovery of biological mechanisms, public cells, real information, and then there were technical developments in both the uh, cellular technologies for mapping the genome and in uh, the um, innovation of the component technologies, which has been basic so for doing all this kind of work. And of course, one has been a lot of deciphering the genes, that is, by uh, cloning, making contacts, and so forth. We are getting first to look at that. I want to pinpoint uh, the time in the 1950, just before and just after. There were these three uh, uh, events which uh, I think is uh, sort of a key to modern genetics. And that was uh, that DNA, finally, after 20 years or more, actually, uh, in 1944, were established as the hereditary material. Everyone before that, everyone, many people thought it was, it has to be protein because of the complexity that could uh, 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 shape. Now, so it wasn't really taken up the way it should have. But uh, when the chemical structure of the DNA strand was uh, shown in '53 by Watson and Crick, most people had accepted it. And, uh, and it was in '56 when the chromosomes uh, were defined. That is, the DNA molecules is not a long term, it is divided into 24 very specific DNA fragments, called that, which each of them carry a specific set of genes. Now, the uh, <coughs> Genome Project was started in 1990 and it was an international consortium and about originally 20 groups involved from six countries, United States, United Kingdom, Japan, France, uh, Germany and China. And uh, there was a 15-year plan originally uh, and that was, the first one was to identify and map all human genes at the time uh, the general idea was that it should be something between 80 and 100,000 genes. And the second one was to sequence the genome to about 3 million bases, which was known only at that time. The fourth point established functional categories of all the genes. And uh, the fourth, to analyze genetic variations uh, between the humans. And nucleotide polymorphism, and SNPs and the structural variants. But also, already in 1990, they uh, put, up, put up on the agenda that it was very important to uh, develop new sequencing technologies and a lot of efforts were put into that. Thing. And uh, also it was there that one should map and sequence five uh, of the model organisms which were used much in experimental studies of genetics. And that's for the purpose, of course, of getting more functional ideas of what do genes do. And then it was, of course, to establish uh, the uh, uh, gene banks of various kinds and how to look into this. The gene bank and the last way of how to get into all the information and find exactly what you find and in which context and so forth. And also, I should mention that the ELSI program, that is the ethical, legal and social implications which there were by having this possibility of cloning genes, which was uh, at the time uh, quite uh, discussed actually in the society, and also what to do with the information you had. Mm -hmm. So that was established as an LC project already in uh, I here have put up the uh, major milestones that uh, is given up by uh, different sources uh, before, from the uh, Start at 56, as you see, they take up 56 with the uh, uh, uh finding of the chromosomes. It's the first one. And then there passes here 20 years, much more, until 77, when Fred Sanger uh, uh, learned the techniques and colleagues, well, the techniques of the one, DNA sequencing. Uh, actually, that happened if you uh, come back to this. There was, uh, yeah, we don't have to go into that. And now we should yeah, we go back to that. Let's see here. This is uh, the chromosome, and this is the guy, Albert Levon, 
a very uh, intelligent, smart guy and also a very nice person. So I owe him a lot and he has been my mentor from the time he's there now since now he is. Anyway, uh, <coughs> sorry. it was an important seminar also at the Daily Boss time when they first were able to do uh, the genetic map uh, based on restriction fragments and polymorphisms. And that was in 80 and the Sangha did the first. It was small but still a sequence completely against almost a human um, mitochondria. That was in 81. Then there were, and that's important to stress actually, the US Department of Energy is uh, one of the founders, actually they took up the discussion all about the Human Genome Project already in the middle of the 80s. And actually, uh, in 87, 88, they took it uh, to um, start discussions, 87, yeah, and then they called it, with the uh, NIH. And then they start discussing how to do this as a you know, And the human you know, organization that was established in 88 and in 1990. So we should start now discussing the identifying and mapping the genes and sequencing them. And then we should uh, pinpoint here the recombinant DNA technology, which uh, <coughs> two major, and that's the uh, recombinant DNA cloning and DNA cloning. Uh, and that was in 73. And uh, it was uh, due to a large extent for the, the uh, Restriction enzymes, the development of the restriction enzymes in '73. Actually, an uh, innovation which was uh, given a Nobel Prize. And it was the cloning vectors and plasmids coming out. And then in '75, we have the Sanders, uh, or Southern, Southern Block method, molecular hybridization. If you heard in '77, then we have the Southern DS DNA sequencing. And in '86, the polarized chain reaction. made things uh, a little bit more easy. I don't know if so many of you have been in the cloning. Uh, anyway, it <coughs> was very important stuff. Why was it? Well, by having the restriction enzymes, you could, uh, and, and cloning, you could uh, get out one particular DNA sequence, not the three billions, one, and uh, make a large number of copies so that you could start doing analyzing took that one, you put it in a vector, and then you get it into bacteria, which grow and grow, and then you selected only this particular sequence of humans. So it was very important at that. And the restriction enzymes, there are specific, specific types of endonucleases. Endonucleases cuts down the DNA or breaks down. These have a binding only on a particular sequence. Usually six as here, or in Bar one, there are those with four, there are those with eight. And if you treat it with that, they bind to that and then they cleave it. And then even tail over. So show there. And uh, if you do it on two different sources, you could uh, both down or cleave, and then they could be annealed again. And using a DNA ligase to get a new DNA. No, no, you have the uh, one. This one. Here. We got the new DNA a molecule linked, co completely intact. But here is from one source and here on from another source. <coughs> and uh, to get it now in in uh, in uh, you know, it's possible to use uh, to use uh, uh, methods or using methods for analyzing the area, you have to clone it. And uh, these particular cloning vectors, uh, they should be capable of replicating in the host and they should also have the selectable uh, Markers, gene markers, and uh, one typical example is this one, the PUC, the PUC18, or PUC18 as we usually talk about. That uh, has, uh, I think it's 12 or something, different restrictions. So you could cut your DNA with either of these and clone it into this. And you make the molecule and then you transform it to a bacteria and let the bacteria grow. And uh, each bacteria, as you see, oh, here is again. You have here the uh, 
the vector and you will see you know make DNA and then you do the section side and you make a cloning uh, make an uh, uh, yes you come that DNA into and you put it into that DNA and you grow and uh, you will find it you grow it and then each individual colony here is the is only from one type of sequence, right? So if you isolate one colony here, it will contain a number of a, a large number of a specific human sequences that to start with. Uh, now, yeah, we should put it up. Also, this was a very controversial thing for cloning. I was at uh, the EMBL in Europe at the time, and there was really, as I said, I had. Initially, it's kind of astronaut education. That is, all the things you have to put on, all the kinds of spurs you have to go through. It took almost an hour to get into that particular lab where you were allowed to do the covenant DNA. And uh, also, the, when you're getting up. And it was only, as I said before, the NIH in the test. And, uh, and the, the, the thing was that if now a, a DNA coming of a human and bacteria out in the the uh, air, what would happen? It may cause an epidemic. No one really knows. I mean, we did a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot over the years, but I think in 83, 80, no, 85 or something. That was close. You can do it on other places when they found out that there is no risk. All of these together. And then there are thousands of examples. They were less viable than were uh, other bacteria if they were not nutrient, yet nutrient. Uh, very, very good. They die. So and that was, of course, good uh, in order to continue with this. And I'm sorry, how does it work? Or what happened? What should I do to get it further here? I think it just dies. And, yeah. Hmm? Is that one? Oh, that's the first one. Yeah. Uh, in order to get uh, any kind of, of analysis at the time, you talk about DNA markers and you have to map it, and you use these fragments, which were called RFLP fragments, for this purpose. Later, there were others. What happened with the other one? Did you? Oh, sorry. And, uh, no, sorry. Uh, that was one important step. To do it, you uh, did what we call a sudden blot. You digested the genomic DNA with the restrictions and you rectified uh, the DNA fragments of and of the gel, and then you hybridized it with the uh, radio labeled DNA probe. That is the DNA sequence you had in clone. Right? And then you take it out. Oh yes, you have this <laughs> point. Uh, here you have an example of how you did the characterization. Uh, you have two DNA uh, molecules. They could be the two chromosomes you have. Yes, and you're looking at specific locus. There are in the apple, you see three sides where the uh, equal one, in this case, uh, could be cut. This but in the second one, there is a mutation in the center of that. So in that case, that means that in the other one, you will create two. Uh, between these two sides, uh, the other sides, two different. Now it works? Oh, that's a point. Oh, that's another point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here they will break two, two uh, fragments, right? And here, there, there. And whereas in the, this alley here, in the other chromosome, there will only be one since there is this mutation there. So running that uh, out of using labeling a probe sequence which covers over both this here. Yeah. And uh, how can you use that to hybridize the gel? You will get, if you have only that type, you are homozygous for LL1, you will get these two fragments, that and that. If you are homozygous for that, you will only get that fragment, and if you are uh, heterozygous, you will get these three. So, this is sort of the general basis there. And uh, this was going on until for most of the work. Thanks for uh, up to uh, 1986 when uh, things became simpler by this. Uh, 
polymerase chain reaction. And what you do there is that you have you uh, use a type two DNA. Uh, 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 map, you take the DNA, you map it so that the strands are separated, and you use two primer sequences. Uh, was it here? Uh, one which is uh, an E2, complementary to this end, uh, and the other, on the other strand, right, is complementary to this end here, and uh, when you add <coughs> polymerase, you will, add, you will uh, uh, create two new strands. You denature it again, and do this, you repeat the process, and then do it again, and repeat the process, and you get a lot of DNA, very simply, this way, compared to doing the clone. It doesn't mean that you don't need the, the cloning anyway because of other things. And now, <coughs> there was using these uh, was about what you had and used uh, cloning and had some cloning uh, libraries and so forth uh, when the uh, human project was established. And the first comprehensive gene uh, genetic linkage map became in 92. And uh, the first physical map in 94. And, um, then you were doing a lot of cloning or trying to make cloning contents. That is, do I have the page here? Can you go back and forth on that, right? This type, right? You chop the DNA down and uh, you do it to get fairly large pieces of DNA. You uh, use only a, a, a um, partial restriction, that is, a lower concentration at a shorter time. So that, not all, only a few. You see them as red spots here. Here are all the different restriction sites where, but the red ones are those which were actually cut here. The rest were not because of the look. And that means that you generated these large sequences, but you got them all in uh, the test tube, so which is made here. Yeah. So you have to clone them, and then you have to make a copy. That is to find which one, this is the one, uh, oh, no, that's the one. Not the best one. Oh, yeah. Okay, this one. You have to have find clones which partially overlap with that. And another one partially overlap with that, and so forth. And that is much more complex than one uh, uh, originally thought. And uh, to do it, uh, to start with, and the more over, I think, was done, was doing it in the yeast chromosome. There you could clone up to one million bases. Compared to the plasmid, I first showed you that was only uh, one uh, to two, up to one, uh, up to uh, two kilobases. This could be up to one million bases in here. But there were the problem, which was not recognized at all, and that is that there were a number of gaps. And uh, these were um, represented uh, by, or by rearrangements and uh, the repeats may then get out and get in in the opposite direction or they could be missing. So there was a lot uh, which made a um, difficult process. Oh, this one. Made a difficult process. It was uh, mostly at these specific DNA sequences, repeated sequences, and some of which in total, they represent over 50% of the gene. <coughs> So then we are getting <coughs> to the point where we could sequence. And that is the Human Genome Project, which uh, used the, uh, the, what is called, the uh, top-down procedure. You have the DNA from the uh, individual, and you cut it up and make clones, and you make the uh, context. And then you, you uh, random fragmentize each of these, and then you sequence these fragments here. And Hopefully you find the sequence here, and the sequence here, and part of it will overlap with this one, part of it will overlap with this one, and so forth. However, there was a guy, and still is, Gerard <coughs> Welter, who established the company Celera. He said that one could do it the other way around. You don't have to worry about all this. And that was late, it was in 98, so the the sequencing technology has advanced enormously since my years. Anyway, what he said is that, um, and published later on, 
that you take the genome and you uh, put it down to random fragmentation and then you just uh, sequence it. And we put all together at the end here. Now, uh, most of us have been in the world, we know that uh, that can't work that way. But uh, never mind. Uh, they, uh, he says it does. Some of the co workers I say they actually use the uh, commonly available NIH data because they were there, but they didn't have to do that. If they had liked it, they could have done it without really. Now, considering all the gaps and all the things, and that when these first maps came out, it was only not covering only 90% of the genome in 2001. And here is uh, a nice picture, I think, uh, on how to sequence. You have the DNA, you denature it, and uh, you add them, um, uh, the uh, nucleotides, and uh, a small, at a small concentration, also you use uh, deoxy, ATC, and so forth. And that means that uh, now and then, if you polymerize this, uh, that, that we can an A or a T base deoxy into the sequence, and then it will stop polymerization. It ends that. And that means that you get fragments, if you look at the, those you're running out from the gel afterwards, which are representing a number of different sizes. And having then we labeled these uh, uh, bases labeled with the uh, torsions, uh, colors which are different for the different bases, you will see each each level. There is one there is one uh, neutral team base different between that and that and that and that and so forth. And you can see in this position which is it. And uh, you take it over to the computer and you will see this strands here or the different colors and which means they have the different um, bases. Oh, this is the sequence rainbow as they call it, that center, I think it's a beautiful picture if you want to on the wall, right? Anyway, why I, why I show it here is to emphasize on the enormous sequence technology development. This was made in the year 2000, and at that time, as I said, it has already developed quite a lot. 400,000 bases was completed in one day. You only had to go back to in the mid-1980s. If you got 500 bases a day, which the best laboratories could, that was a good result. I remember in the early 80s at, at the MBL, if we got 100 bases established during a week or something, we were very happy. You had to repeat a bit better get over, and so forth. So that has been an enormous, I mean, almost a thousand times. And even after that, it has been um, better. Now, there was the establishment now of all these databases. You have the gene bank here. At the you have this at the NBL, which is actually a collaboration in Europe nowadays with uh, uh, Hinson in uh, with the European Bioinformatics Institute. They are under the same heading on the NBL. Anyway, and you have the uh, uh, Japanese one, the DBJ. And you have the bioinformatics tools, the ensemble, which is used to browse, uh, and you have BLAST, and you have uh, this other one, UCSE, and you have a number of other ones. But these are fairly. Uh, use very much. So if you are interested in a particular small area of the genome, in that chromosome and a certain position, I think they mentioned here, what is it? Uh, CQ. Oh, you can go in there and you could see at various resolutions what genes are there, are the markers and so forth, getting further looking for the exons and so forth, right? So that's a very important. If you look at some features here, we're summing up what you really found in uh, 2001 when it was then published. The genome size was in about 3,200 nanoses. And still, the protein coding makes up about 2%. And the non coding repetitive DNA was estimated to about 50%. And the gene number now was down to something like 30 to 40,000 which uh, is, uh, of course, uh, far fewer than the 80 to 100,000 initially started with, but still uh, more. And there were some RNA genes recognized, about 3,000 at that time, but it was mentioned as uncertain, actually, how. Uh, and there are also these uh, pseudogenes, that is, genes which has been there uh, in the evolution and has been inactivated, so it doesn't work. But 
already in 2008, I want to point to that now here, after eight years, one starts to get problems in really defining what is a gene. It's becoming very complex. And that's because you find that you have overlapping genes that have the same sequence may be used for, for uh, coding several genes, o overlapping. And then you have genes within genes, such an example of that also. You have alternative splicing. In humans, for example, each gene has, has on average five splicing products. And if they go out of open reading frames, you, you will uh, get new codes and you get completely different proteins out of it. And in uh, alternative promoters, in the, in the DMD gene, you have seven different promoters, and uh, depending on uh, which uh, uh, one of them is active, that is, has to do with the, the tissue, you will produce different uh, proteins. And then you have uh, RNA genes, and they estimate, uh, over the 2008, that has to be at least 20,000. And what other things were there? Yeah. We uh, don't know what other things there is, but they are coming up a lot of new data which we talk now. But first, I'll show you these genes within genes. This is a mitosis gene. So if you go in uh, one of the strands, informative strands of the mitosis gene, and at one, in that intron, this is the last gene, intron 26, it says, looking in the other strand at that DNA sequence, you got three other genes coded there. So on this stretch, there, well, there, are, there are four genes coded by the same DNA sequence. So now we're talking about more uh, uh, what comes next now, after, and that is the omics revolution. I mean, genomics is the first one, right? Not the gene, but the gene in its context of the whole genome. But then there are a number of others, and we have just mentioned them here, we're not going to be there. And then there are the new genomics project, that is, projects which sort of makes even more details available within genomics. Well, here, I'm taking it a little bit up on another segment, but uh, uh, the proteomics which we talked about, except genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and so forth. We talked about a little bit further. Uh, that, and they are progressing very extensively. So what I should concentrate a bit on the last part here now is to uh, the human, uh, the, sorry, the new genomics project. The human genome project, which we talked about uh, next week, I think, sometime. The HealthMap project, which has been essential for the GWAS exercise, but we, which we're not talking about here. And then the ECN code project, which we will talk more about here, which has to do with finding out the functional specificities of the genome, which they found is much, much, much greater than we believed before. A little bit on uh, just mentioning the personal genome project, and then uh, we talk uh, is about the thousand genome project, which has also added a lot of important information here. So let's start with the end code. That was also an international consortium, starting in uh, 2003, to study uh, the functional elements of the genome, the protein level, the RNA level, and regulatory uh, uh, elements that control cells and circumstances by which uh, cells, uh, genes are active in cells. In 2012, it was <coughs> officially close 10 years after it started, uh, 22 uh, institutions worldwide have been involved for 10 years. They have all together uh, generated 1,640 uh, data sets from analyzing 147 types of cells and tissues. Enormous. And take it together, the greater idea has the, or what the genomic you know, landscape has turned up. And I'll show you this. Oh, this picture is the first one. This was a pic This is a picture of the the. Um, paper coming out in science in 2012, as you see, which caused a lot of attention and some people. They were saying here that the junk DNA, you can forget about that. What we believed up to the, you know, uh, yeah, 2000, 2000 and actually mostly of the time of the, that 80-90% uh, of the genome were inactive. They were junk. 
They are telling us that they are not, and they are based on based in now on these uh, these uh, uh, analysis they done. So here you have the gene, the coding, as you said, uh, the coding protein coding gene. Here you have the exons, and you have the introns, and you have the cis regulatory elements that promote the transcription sites. And here you have long range regulatory elements, enhancers, repressors, silences, and insulators. And then, which could be situated uh, up to uh, here, uh, uh, up to a mega base or even more. And they could be actually on different chromosomes. They interact, so they are in interaction with all parts of the genome in a way to a particular gene. And this uh, has a regulatory function. If it works in one way or in another way, depending on that it has a mutation and some change there, the uh, gene will not work the way it does. So, by using that definition, they, oh yes, I should show this one. This has expanded now since the 2012. That's expanded. There are 16 different tests now, which you can request from them. And you can go into them to look at, to evaluate this. And all in all, they then show that 80% of the genome is functionally active. It has importance for how the genes work and what the cells do. And of course, changes all over this may effects on the expression of what is really. Uh, in total, they say that there are 20,687 uh, genes, and they are pretty ex exact. They say there may be 50 more, and I'm not sure that it's uncertainty about. There are protein uh, coding regulatory read, 70,000 promoters. As I told you, there were many genes have protein coding genes, have several promoters. If you look at the uh, these regulatory cells, the enhancer regions, that time, 400,000. 20 times as many as there are these, right? And then the, the RNAs, <coughs> which are not involved in uh, coding, TRNAs, uh, 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 RNAs, we should say, and the long non coding RNA. Uh, which are involved in uh, gene regulation in various ways. And there are actually, in total, I think, the RNA, R, the RNA world, as it's called today, includes something like 15 different types of RNAs. And uh, there were 18,400, would say, sort of gay uh, gene signature of the RNA signature. They considered from the, the function part. And then they uh, looked at the, also the one established the, the uh, souvenirs and they said that there were 18, uh, 11,224 inactive genes. However, and that is an interesting observation, it seems that some of these pseudogenes are active in some cells in some individuals. If they look at more, it could be that each and every one come in some of our cells, one of the or two or so, of the pseudogenes are actually functioning. But there says to be looked at, but it's a very interesting observation that they could prove that at least some of them are. Um, and then they also show that the SNPs associated with disease, it's important that they are enriched in these non-coding functional elements. So you pick them up when you do screenings for uh, finding uh, uh, sequences which are related to diseases that are changed in per persons having the disease. Okay, so just a few words about the personal uh, genome project. That was started in the mid-2007, I think, of 2000. You see here, I'm mean, not going through that, but it is showing, and just concentrate on that, the price of the, the cost for sequencing is all the time uh, getting lower and lower and lower. And when it reached this level here in the media, uh, and James Watson were, uh, were sequenced, as you know. And uh, 2007, I think it was, yeah, George Church at Harvard thought the time was, uh, open, was right now for doing the personal genome project that each and everyone who wanted should would have their uh, genome uh, uh, sequenced and get the. Uh, 
We have next generation technologies that make reading DNA fast, cheap, and widely accessible. All can be read less than a decade. And uh, in that case, he was to some uh, probably right. However, uh, the project did uh, not work for so long time. It was uh, still not uh, good. The prices were too, too uh, high. And uh, it turns out that if they participated, or those who did it, they have to be prepared that they should be, uh, that uh, their, the results of their sequence should be out generally available. And uh, knowing what Greg Venter uh, remember James Watson, you know, he has restricted the parts of the genome that he doesn't want the public to know about. But also, uh, this technique by, by exome sequences came up in this period, and more and more of the uh, no student uh, personal genome you know, project had to work, tends to go over to exome sequencing, which you are doing here with uh, very good results, I understand. Uh, and then you sequence the 800, uh, 180,000 exons of the person's genome, and the cost for that is $1,000, or less than $1,000, and even lower maybe today, that's the figure I want. And that very extreme high coverage which means a very, very exact uh, sequence. And then the exon sequence then reveals the mutation inherited <coughs> in the exons. But of course, as we talked about earlier now, <coughs> there is a number of mutations having effect, at least on, on uh, diseases, which is not in the exons. You have to look for other methods, and already you are doing that to some extent also, I guess. One major effort taken up about this is the Thousand Year Long Project, which was started in 2007 uh, in uh, Europe. It was the uh, it was the uh, EMBL and Hingston in England, and a number of different labs involved in this. And the <laughs> when they when they published their paper ten years after <coughs> that is at the end of 2015. It was. 10 years in 2016, so at the end of 2015, in November, December, so This is the Nature, it was published in Nature, you see, what it looked like, the number of people, you see them a little bit different, and, so forth, and it says, end of the beginning. And uh, to me, in my age, I associate, can't help, an expression of Winston Churchill, I was so small, but they talked about it all over, talk you have in the, at the end of the World War. This is not the end. Not even the beginning of the end. It is the end of the beginning. Exactly that sentence is put here. Trying to say that now we have started something of great importance, which only is the beginning of something quite new and extensive thing. Anyway, uh, well, we don't have this. This time, since it collects people, uh, it's uh, sequencing genomes from people all over the world. It has a number of different aspects, and one is searching groups for illness, the other one is the population genetic one, grouping into evolutionary history. This is one of the papers in uh, by this uh, genome, and uh, this is the other one. Uh, two big papers coming out in Nature. Uh, we should not go through all this, but we notice here that is 2,500 individuals in the end. They started with 1,000, but 2,500 actually. 26 different populations. And it was uh, the, to provide a comprehensive description of uh, the genetic variants. Uh, just showing here uh, why the populations are standing from, and you see it's representing over 26 different, 26 different types. You have in Asia, China, Japan, India, you have in Africa, you have in Europe, South America, and in, in uh, North America here in the States. Without going further into that, we uh, also take up the goal, uh, we just mentioned the rules here, to illustrate the properties and distributions of common and rare genetic variations in human. And to provide insight into the processes that shapes this diversity in humans, and also so to provide advanced understanding of disease biology. And already that has started to come out things like that. One key question here was that they realized that you had to make very distinct classification of changes made in the genome. So they put it into 10 different genetic variants. There were those involving only one nucleotide, the SNPs 
or the index, the, one, the, the uh, insertion or the deletion of one base. And then there were eight which contained more than one base, and we call them the structure, this is called the structure of uh, deletion, duplicates, and so forth, we don't have to go into. And if you look at that type now, uh, that type of, of categorization, on all individuals. You take any individual, you will see if you compare that with the reference genome, that is all the, the average of the 2,500, you will see that uh, there are between 4 and 5 million uh, sites, which are sites that are affected in the human. 99% uh, are uh, SNPs or short angles, and then only 0.1% are this uh, structure there. But, because the length of the structure variants could be quite big and the different types of they affect 20 million bases. So that's the average difference between individuals. Now, uh, and here I'm going to just take, in, so in total, it's 24 to 25 million base signals. 20% of these are the same and 80% of the structure variants. And a number of these, that's important to pinpoint all this race, all those are enriched on haplotypes with, which are identified the, by the known wide association uh, uh, sites uh, made on uh, you know, seek for genes behind uh, diseases. So they are, some of them, preferentially there in people having a disease. And that's the structure balance. All these new uh, regions of the genome that we didn't know anything, but it was there, but we didn't know so much about them, has done in Africa. And they also showed that uh, the uh, nourishment of uh, the QTS, expression of the QTS, quantity check uh, user, which is of the same category as those in us. So, the Thousand Genome Project now, the consortium there is. You say at the end of that that uh, all of the, this program now is officially ended. There are two that they think very important things to one another. One is it's a need to continue to develop and add further data to expand the understanding of the human you know, uh, variation as well as relation to diseases. And the other one is one has to look at the other level or other levels in the same uh, of complexity and in particular it's like genetic changes that have an important role in regulating. And we talk about that next time. So, what did they do? Well, they have engaged now in England, it's fantastic, uh, to, to uh, undertake an uh, undertaking of sequencing 100,000 people which has common diseases or rare diseases. And some of them also have healthy controls, of course, but the healthy controls they could take from a number of other. The projects which are, but they will lose part of it. And of course, knowing that will, will uh, have an, more, an enormous impact on the development of personal medicine for the future. You know. I can say that uh, they already now have in collaboration with the uh, Pan Cancer Analysis of all genomes and a number of other big projects translation are there. So, genomics and the future, what shall we say? Considering all the things about the genomics, which is steadily uh, with the Encode project, the 1000 Genome project, and now the 100,000 project, genome story coming up, we can look forward to a very exciting era of genomics, not least in personal medicine. Okay, thank you. Any questions to take up now? Of course, I'm willing to discuss many of these things are very complicated. So if you want to discuss things about this, you can uh, look up, put me up, and we could uh, take a discussion about it. But there is a lot, a lot of things which has come out after you know uh, projects, you know, which uh, in general those not being in the business, but uh, sort of in the reference that doesn't realize. That's very important that that is considered and started to be used in the <coughs> Can I ask one question? Sure. That probably could be a, a day long question. 
but based on everything that you've been a part of and, and have learned, what what is there anything that stands out as being most surprising to you or most counterintuitive about the genome? Well, I must say, really, being there all the time, that uh, this uh, the the echo there that eighty percent of the genome should be active. It is about uh, 20 times more than earlier. And all the things, and actually also from the uh, chromosomal studies, they thought that uh, you could uh, do uh, the experimental uh, organisms a lot of changes and it seems to work. So probably the genes, the functional parts are not so bad, it's only that they help uh, keep it together in various forms. And they talk about when it comes to plants, and I don't know, maybe to some extent it's true, that uh, uh, they having so much helps covering and uh, keep them in relation to too much heat and uh, too much uh, cold and so forth. The most general ideas. And the chromatin part sort of protects the small little part, which was the, the genes from uh, uh, getting uh, affected. And uh, that has been one, and I must say also that uh, when the, um, the uh, to start there, since I was in the process, the uh, uh, recombinant uh, uh, technologies, it's fascinating me with that you actually can cut down and clone with that particular sequence and all that. That was a very fascinating. Then most of the other things come sort of as a rational uh, continuation of that, having done that, you've done that, and you've done that, and so forth. I could say that, personally, that these uh, techniques for doing uh, cellular uh, mechanisms for mapping, doing cell hybrids, and then later on doing the uh, radiation hybrids, was very complicated stuff. And that was used initially, before you had, uh, and in the early stages, also when you had recombinant DNA, you used them. I'm just saying, where you have a few human chromosomes in the background of uh, a rodent, mouse, shiny cells, or so forth. And you could test it for enzymes expressed before we had the, uh, the recombinant DNA technology, and then when we had that for the different clones. And in that way, you made up the first map, which was very important to start with. And, you went on further. and then at the end, and as it say, uh, 1988 was one of the references here. Then the Gene Bridge uh, panel, the Gene Bridge project, was in there to sort of close up. So this, uh, and Gene Bridge says that, yeah, this is the context, that this is one in, and the bridge over to the next, and to the next, and so forth. They use this, uh, these um, radiation hybrid panels. Uh, I could, no, I don't have the pictures here, and quite what I could, ex someone is interested in that, I could show you what it is. And that was because the GIST, uh, chromosomes uh, had such big gaps and had these uh, changes there, so one couldn't rely on it. You have to, and then when you use it the, by the radiation hybrids, as was the Stanford panel and this Gene Bridge 4 panel, I think. They sort of tied the whole thing together. They opened the bag and then it was filled and then they tied it together. You know about that also, the radiation, have you heard about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yes? I'm just wondering, so it seems like throughout most of this short history, the focus was on the codons, so the coding sequence, and I look, looking forward, it seems like there's going to be a big focus on intergenic non coding sequence, and I'm wondering what you foresee as the best, sort of what, what path are we going to take as far as deciphering this non coding sequence? Well, I take it as, uh, again, it was emphasized, the regulatory sequences which are all over there. I think we have to recognize that uh, no single gene makes a sig makes an effect on the, the phenotype alone. It is dependent on a number of other genes and regulators all over, and which other genes are affected in the cell at the time in the specific tissue and so forth. So that is this overall genomic aspect is becoming very important. And I think that also when it comes to diseases, for example, that we have to think for not finding individual genes, finding a uh, genome prof profile, or should say, a genomic signature, which may be different for those having uh, a certain disease, which 
there are differences. It may come up via that mechanism or via that mechanism. We know that you have particular signatures. And that again is then taking all of this now into consideration when you uh, should uh, look in more specific specifics. What is happening and why? <coughs> so I believe all the promoters and the enhancer regions have been allocated. Sorry? The promoter, the 70,000 promoters and yeah. 200,000 enhancers. Yeah. Are they allocated very clearly? They are allocated so very what clearly. So would be the best way to search Exactly, for exactly. And they are already started to put them into some, some of the new uh, race stuff, you know, or the chips, as I understand it. And uh, of course, as alternatives to axons, they were put in a number of them already, or not alternative, to expand that kind of approach. And they are in this. Asking, is I'm, I'm asking, is there a database that, like, if I'm interested in a gene, how would I look for all the promoters for those genes? How, do, how can you visualize it? Like, where's the data out online? You go so into the, this, uh, you have to go into ENCODE and you go into the various uh, packages they have, where you could see all. I haven't. Look, I, I must say. I mean, I, I know about it and I understand it uh, based on. Uh, but I haven't been in there to look at it. But That's what it I should mean, be I fairly know. simple. I understand, but I don't know exactly. No, but they don't, they don't, the problem is yeah. going to be is it's easy to identify an enhancer unit. Right. It's difficult to identify what it enhances. Okay. Well, it, I mean, you, yeah. the enhancer yeah. doesn't have to be near the gene. It could be enhancing a gene far away. Well. We, you have assays that will tell you this sequence is an enhancer, but that doesn't tell you what gene it's enhancing. But if you go into this, you will find that as the picture here shows, in some cases at least, let's go back in. There. You will find that a particular gene Here, right? It will be affected by sequences here, sequences here, which are over the genome, and we know what different places and on other chromosomes, which for individual genes they know in some cases, not in all, but they've already seen it to some extent. So if you go into one of these packages here looking for, you will probably pick up things which you think are. I don't know to what extent, but it's developing, as I said, all the time, and there is a lot of access. So if you. Uh, coupled it to the perspective you have and in, in specificities in your own project. I guess you will get quite a lot of it. Actually, the ENCODE data does not necessarily link any functional element to a particular yeah. gene. Right. What no. it does, no. it identifies all the elements yes. which they have compiled yes. used on different yeah. cell lines. That's true. But and in some cases, yeah. there happens yeah. to be so. That yeah. so well, there are, That's what yeah. I said. Yeah. But I know what is that? It is like, so if you go to the encode data, mm -hmm. like, there is a list of 177 cell lines, mm -hmm. and what the goal was here to identify all elements, mm -hmm. whether you know what they are doing or not. So, like, each of this method mm -hmm. is designed. Mm -hmm to identify transcriptionally active elements. Mm -hmm. and, and don't forget, we, we published a paper that indicates enhancers don't have to be no, they, in non-coding yeah. regions. The enhancer can be in an exon of another gene. Right. So they're not going to fall, not all enhancers are going to, or not enhancer marks are going to fall in the dark matter. They can fall in the coding region of another gene. Yeah, one yes, way to look at all of them is just to turn on all the cell lines no. that are present at close to the specific area. No, there are variants in that, and that's why there are 150, 150 cell lines, I think it was something like that. And there are a number of tissues. And they looked at some looking now at the embryonal stem cells, and they're looking at some cancer cells, and, uh, and these uh, IPS cells is also starting. So there's a lot, and it's go. Cool. But of course, there are no finished solutions, right? But you get a lot to hook on to very if you're interested in some specifics. Yeah. 
Ja. Ja, ja.